All right, we are now here with the second part tonight, and the most importantly are the guests in studio and the voices that will be joining us in this conversation, looking at where is Kenya headed? Dialogue, no dialogue, and if there is any dialogue, it, if it is anything to go by, where do we even start from? Uh, Kipruta Arab Kirwa, a governance uh, analyst, thank you very much for creating time. You're also very senior in terms of <laughs> politics. Thank you so much. We are looking forward to your thoughts. Yes. on this matter. I appreciate it. Also with us is Martin Andati, who is a governance and political analyst. Good evening and welcome to KTN News. Good evening. Thanks for hosting me after a long time. After a long time. Yes. Welcome I'll back. Take welcome a break. home. <laughs> 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 All right. We'll also be joined virtually by Dr. Eric Komolo, who is a political analyst tonight. He'll be joining us to equally share his thoughts um, on the way forward for the country. It's very good to have you tonight. Even though you couldn't make it in studio physically, we're glad you're joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to be all right, gentlemen, let us start because we have very limited time to discuss matters of, you know, uh, national, uh, you know, um, status quo. And let's start with the firing of the entire cabinet. You, you know, we saw the Gen Z come out, quite a historic demography, got a lot of people speaking, not just in the country, but worldwide. And all this pressure, all right, got to the, of course, the sitting uh, president, he fired the entire cabinet, the 21 cabinet secretaries, but of course left in office, the deputy president and the prime cabinet secretaries. Your opening remarks, even as we have on the screen, the graphics that got us to this point. Let me start with, um, of course, Kipruto Arab Kira. In your opening remarks to the place where we are at, including the national dialogue, we now expect to pick up and a cabinet that has the face of the nation. In fact, Kipruto, you are very, you're a diplomat, I believe. Yes, and the, I, the I, words I, of a nation, <laughs> uh, a state, a republic, are we in the making of a nation? Or are we truly, as the, as the of course, the uh, national anthem says, the God of our creation bless our nation? What are we? Welcome to the yeah, broadcast. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Doreen. I think the, 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 is, uh, there, there are a number of things that we just need to capture first. The issue is the question of the country, mm -hmm. the nation, and the state. Uh, the country, yes, we are, because we are within the same landmass of Kenya. But there are many other challenges that we need, still need to sur surmount for us to qualify to be a state, and subsequently, we hope, we'll get to the level of being a nation. A nation is slightly higher than the state in the sense that uh, we have common history, we have common language, culture, and other engagements that give us to tolerate each other as members of that particular nation. I can say we are still a, na a state within a collection of nations and nationalities. All right. So what am I trying to say? I'm saying that we still got so many challenges to surmount for us to be able to qualify as a state. And this also comes with our historical heritage that we copied from the British. And um, up to now, one, we have not built a strong institutions of democracy, including the need for me to be in the opposition or to be in government without feeling that I should cross the floor to the other side. We've also not built enough tolerance among ourselves. We have also not built enough trust, such that if you are doing something, I should trust you of necessity that you will not go beyond these red lines that are provided for by the nation. So these are some of the challenges we are going through. And also we've not reined in bad manners that many of us in the political class do have. Mm -hmm. And that includes the issue of ignoring the wishes of the people. Say that when you are elected, you behave as if you own that territory of Kenya. You own the title deed of Kenya. These are challenges that unless we surmount them, we are going to find it wrong. Finally, for this particular phase, it is important that if it is a political problem, we solve it politically. If it is a social problem, we solve, we'll solve it using the necessary tools. If it is a moral challenge, we don't bring political solution to a moral challenge. And the GNC have been very clear they have been focusing on the issues that are affecting them 
and affecting the entire nation. All right, I'll come back to you. Having served in, the, of course, the cabinet uh, in Kibaki, the late president's tenure, um, we're coming back to that so that we can also look if anything is akin then to the term that you served in as far as presenting a new cabinet, especially this week, is concerned. Allow me to hear the opening remarks of uh, Martin Andati, who is a governance and political analyst. In fact, a lot of voices are coming up to say Raila should be very careful in as far as this dialogue is concerned. Are we seeing more politics in play than we're seeing the true interest of the Kenyan in play? Welcome. Well, uh the first thing I'll say is uh, it's very sad that uh, we've lost lives right. and property. The killings which happened uh, because of the protests were really not necessary. We didn't need to go where to reach where we reached. If we had a government that listens, the public participation was very clear that uh, the bill was not acceptable. And you know, the courts have ruled that uh, public participation is very key. Mm -hmm. If you don't carry out public participation on uh, most of the issues, then whatever you do will not pass uh, the legal test. So we carried out uh, public participation on the bill. And almost, the people wrote a lot of memorandum, which were presented to parliament by Kepsha, Kesha, professional groups, the various stakeholders and the masses out there. But uh, the ruling political class ignored all that. And uh, the president and his team, because they have a majority in parliament, they managed to push the bill through. Of course, they enticed a few of the opposition uh, MPs to also play ball. Martin, if I cut you short, I, I'm sorry this is your opening remarks, but when you speak of the public participation, the deputy president addressed the nation a few moments after the president addressed the nation at that time of the protest. And according to the deputy president, it is that they were not fully informed and that NIS had failed the president, uh, pretty much not about the public participation, but they lacked the understanding of what exactly was happening on the ground. You seem to have not been convinced these remarks. The, the deputy president is part of the problem. You know, it is uh, the height of bad manners for the president to speak. Then after he has spoken, the DP is holding uh, a parallel, uh, an, a, 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 a press conference after. Because uh, when they are elected, you know, we have a pure presidential system. And uh, the president and the deputy are elected on the same ticket. And the, the president is the principal advisor, principal assistant. And uh, he is supposed to be the first person to advise the president. They sit in cabinet. They discuss these issues. They sit in the parliamentary group uh, meetings. The deputy president chairs some of the subcommittees. So we would expect in a functional uh, diplomacy and where people respect institutions, we will not have expected to see what was happening. That clearly tells you that uh, there is dysfunction. And you know, the fallouts have come too fast because uh, the Ruto Uhuru fallouts were there. But uh, it didn't, in the first five years, mm -hmm. people believed it was not real. These guys have come out and told us that uh, it is real. And you know, the DP is on record talking about shareholding, which was uh, very negative of him. But now, you know, he's trying to reinvent himself to look like he is uh, the saint that uh, will save Kenyans. Okay. But he is uh, out there on record saying that uh, he, will, uh, he has put traps in State House to make sure that Raila and anybody opposition leaning does not step there. So what, what uh, the issues we are, uh, which we are going to discuss mm -hmm. and uh, which are causing all these problems are governance, all right. leadership, and then the chap chapter six. You know, we exactly. have leadership and uh, integrity. If we, 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 if we address governance issues, because that is what GNC is talking about, and follow the Constitution 2010. Uh, although President Ruto never believed in, uh, in the Constitution 2010. Is you know, it? He was, yeah, he didn't. I want to just he, hold he your He was on the north side, and uh, he finds himself in power. 
he still thinks he can do things using the old order, unfortunately for him. All right. Unfortunately for the Kenyans, uh, we have a, a very robust constitution. And I want us to come back to that yeah. because you're beginning to bring us deeper into the conversation. But allow me to quickly get the opening remarks of Dr. Eric Komolo, who is a political analyst and equally an advocate. Thank you very much for creating time. You've heard that uh, there were narratives of shareholding. At this point in time, Gen Zs have demanded um, a country that knows no tribe and that everyone is inclusive regardless of which political affiliation they lie under or towards. What are your opening remarks to the direction Kenya is taking tonight? Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, most people know me as an advocate, not really as a political analyst, so I prefer to focus on the law. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from what I can tell, based on the developments over the last uh, one or two months, you can easily tell that first the constitution um, of 2010 is working and it is testing our institutions, particularly those that we seem not to have deliberately empowered like the IBC. So you can see the Gen Z are focused on reconstitution of the IBC. It's also testing parliament as an independent institution that should ordinarily be checking uh, checks and balances. And it's clear that what uh, the demonstrations that the double parliament uh, showed is that to a, a larger population of the country, parliament is seen to be captured and not to be working. It is also testing the police um, you've seen the police uh, inspector general resigning. Mm -hmm. You've seen how they've been perceived not to be um, uh, doing what they are supposed to do as a police service uh, in terms of harassment, abductions, and of course, also testing the military, which is supposed to be a neutral, a bit and protector of all, and many other institutions. So I see a situation where if the institutions are first not deliberately empowered, and two, if those appointed to those positions still take politicized uh, stand where they are meant to be dependent, then reforms that look to me to be triggered now by Gen Z are going to overtake everyone. I think you've mentioned something very important about Mr. Odinga and the stand he took around the national dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a long time we've uh, been in a situation where political parties are uh, perceived not to be particularly ideologically inclined, so more interested in uh, being in power as opposed to the process of, be, of getting to power. And of course, Mr. Dinga has done a wonderful job in trying to uh, uh, create reconciliation after every post-election crisis. But what this is telling you, particularly the outright rejection by not only the agencies but members of his coalition, it's an indication that Kenya is growing and people also want political parties that have a stand, mm -hmm. that are able to hold the government of the day to account, and that if there's supposed to be some national conversation, it should not look to be like just opportunity uh, to grab power. All right. So from where I stand, from where I stand we are quite in a very good path. Uh, the political crisis obviously mismanaged, but certainly we have the institutional structures to solve it. And to come back to you, especially on where to start from, let us not run away from the fact that lives were lost, not only during this protest, but also in Azimio Coalition led protests in 2023. Then we had the Nadiko conversation, which Ray Laudinga, uh, of course, you know, spoke on, even as he convinced other members of his coalition that this particular dialogue, the pushing for gentlemen, is not to sit down with Ruto for any political basis, but for the people. Kipruta Rapkira, yes. you have said several in different, you know, forums that you're not seeking to join government. Absolutely. We're hoping then, if you will clear the air, that you're equally not on this show, planning to join the cabinet in whatsoever, you know, means. But the question is, what is the agenda? When people died, people called for compensation. People say, do not have the dialogue conversation if you do not talk about the high cost of living. Right? Laudinga is saying, there is no different agenda in this dialogue. The same thing Gen Z's are asking for is what the Azimio, or audience for that matter, is asking for. Is this <coughs> correct information? Are you convinced that there's no political play at the expense of Kenyans? Well, I'm equally suspicious as the rest of Kenyans 
that uh, we politicians will become increasingly uh, suspected of mischief whenever there is any discussion between one side and the other. Uh, my prayer today and even tomorrow is that if there is any engagement between the opposition and the ruling coalition, it should be on the basis of identifying and distilling the issues that were raised by GNZ. And uh, with, with that in mind, we'll be able to go fundamentally to Chapter 6 of the Constitution and also all aspects of the Constitution 2010, where certain institutions are in place, but there is an onslaught on those institutions. For example, constitutional offices, you find those constitutional offices, there is a lot of onslaught. The other day in Mombasa, uh, one of, I think that is um, controller of budget, uh, was, was arrested under suspicious circumstances and many other statements made against her. And of course, the controller and auditor general has also been facing a lot of challenges from the, the institution of the executive. All this, apart from the fact that parliament today is a captive of the executive, all these are issues that if we don't have effective separation of power, we are likely to be riddled with these challenges many years to come. So what I beg, and really I beg my colleagues in the Azimio side, that whatever they offer, let President Ruto form his cabinet uh, from among Kenyans. Kenyans don't belong to political parties. All right. If they want people from the section where ODM is strong, whether and the other parties, whether it's a DPK, DAPK, and, and many other parties, or even from Mukambani, there are enough Kenyans who are not in any political formation, but they are people of integrity, people who can fit the bill. And the president is given his team. Once he has his team, he's told to address the issues raised by GNC and also raised by other Kenyans. There is nothing new because the BBI issues raised certain fundamental issues, the clear separation of power be between those in government and those in the opposition mm. and building of institutions such that if I find myself after the general election in the opposition or in the government, I retain that position for five years. We've done 13 general elections, and it's only one time that there was no movement from the opposition to the government or vice versa. Out of 13, it's only one time. That is between 2013 and 2018. Otherwise, from 1963 all the way, there have been some funny movements, either onslaught on the opposition by those in the government or the opposition making overtures towards the government and ensuring that they cross over to government in the intervening period. This is what I say, we are not building institutions that we need to build under the current constitution and even the previous constitution. So according to you, building of these credible institutions that will be independent to serve Kenyans, independent of any political, uh, of course, interference, is important in what might set the agenda for this coming dialogue? It is very important, All right. uh, and, 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 and we should not, we, you know, we are suspected, we in the political class, that's why you're asking me that question, mm -hmm. whether I would take up the position if offered. What I can say, let us watch this space. Let my name be mentioned by the president, and I'll be make, able to make appropriate action, because I believe I'm in the opposition today, and I'm likely to be in the opposition for the next three years, I pray, and I don't wish that the government collapses tomorrow. I want President Ruto to account to the people of Kenya at the end of the five-year term All right. because I'm not a political anar anarchist. Okay. Now, I want us to just hear, before I hear from Martin real quick, the words of Raila Odinga when, of course, he had to clarify his position in as far as the dialogue is concerned. Let us not forget that in history, we've had um, Nusum Kate between Raila Odinga and the late Mwai Kibaki, the former president of the Republic of Kenya, the late now, and also a handshake between Raila Odinga and former president Uhuru Kenyatta. But what is going to be different about this particular dialogue, according to Raila Odinga? Let's listen in to his recent remarks. We have agreed that um, uh, a, a dialogue is the way forward out of the crisis that we're having today in our country. We agree that uh, we give uh, people an opportunity to be heard, to express themselves, 
to come out with the grievances which are actually ailing our country today so that uh, a lasting solution can be found. Martin, Kenyans are asking how genuine that these particular politicians will be this time. Remember, this particular protest that led us here had no Raila as a leader. These are Gen Zs, clearly. But some of the issues, according to Raila Odinga, are unemployment, corruption, ethnicity, debt, and the management of the economy. If you listened to the co-principal Lazimio Martha Karua earlier, she said clearly, do we need a dialogue with President Ruto to discuss corruption? Do we need a dialogue to discuss or investigate police who were, of course, on the spot over the deaths in the protests? Do we need a dialogue to sanitize this country? Martin. We don't need dialogue. You know, uh, Raila Odinga has missed it. And uh, if he is not very careful, he's going to become irrelevant. Because uh, you remember there were the demonstrations 2013-2014 over the 2013-2014 uh, finance bill, especially on the housing levy. But uh, they were like... 2013-2014? Yes, the 2013. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, uh, yes. Yeah. They were largely as Mio-led. And they were on the streets for quite some time, almost two, three months. There was no, the, the bill still went through and it became uh, law. All the things they tried to raise, they were ignored. And uh, the only other thing that came out was uh, they went and sat and said they are doing NADCO. So one year later, the, the proposals which came out of NADCO were ignored. It is only the other day that uh, they now said they are signing the IEBC amendment act bill bill right. into an act of parliament mm. but you know all the other nine proposals were ignored <coughs> you have gen c out there mm -hmm. uh, for 14 days they managed to get uh, the bill with the drone they managed to get uh, the cabinet dissolved yes although there are issues about uh, the position of the attorney general because uh, when you fire the attorney general it means the government cannot sign any document. Uh, there are people who have sued government. If somebody goes to court today, the government is supposed to put in a response. What happens? The courts will give orders again as a government because uh, the government, the state councils and the rest of those guys in the AG's office don't have the mandate to sign documents on behalf of the AG if there's no AG. So there are questions that I think uh, Dr. Magare has moved to court and other Kenyans. Because I think the question is, uh, if the, there is no AG, who is advising the president on legal, legal matters? Mm -hmm. Even to dissolve that cabinet is legal in itself. So the president should have been advised by the AG. Now, even the AG who is supposed to have advised him, he's also out, he's been uh, fired. So and if we reflect, of course, the AG had come out just the day earlier to say that the president wasn't taking the legal advice from his, his office, rather. If you followed that news, he had spoken. Yeah, yeah. he's spoken. He's on record okay. saying that. Yes. So there are issues there. Because there are also other functionaries in State House mm. who allegedly advise uh, the president. The former solicitor general is there and uh, some other lawyers. So, but you know, those ones are uh, not supposed to usurp the powers of the AG. Because right. the powers of the AG, that is a constitutional uh, office with clearly spelled out uh, functions. So uh, the JNZ managed to get uh, Kome out because one of the demands by the Azimio Brigade was that Kome should be pushed out. It never happened. So it tells you that uh, in terms of uh, thinking and strategy, the JNZs are uh, better thinkers. They are better in terms of mobilization they are better in, in terms of execution. Oh. So uh, for the political class, and you know the good thing is now the political class is split. In, uh, in uh, Azmio, it is largely the ODM party leader, Raila, who is pushing for dialogue. The youthful MPs, the likes of uh, Senator Sifuna, Osoti, Nabina Buera, and a few others who are my friends, they have refused. They are not very keen on uh, dialogue. Then you have uh, the other co-principals, 
the likes of Eugene Wamalwa, Kioni, and uh, Karua, and uh, Kalonzo Msioka, they are not for dialogue. But the question is, uh, what new thing are, going, mm -hmm. are they going to discuss? Mm. Because whatever was discussed uh, during NADICO has not been uh, acted on. And you know, you know these are uh, old tactics which were working in the 90s, uh, like the Saitoti Commission. When Kenyans were calling for the repeal of uh, Section 2A, Moshmi was a Kanu MP that time, and he knows it. Mm. Uh, what Moi did was uh, to form the Saitoti Commission, deputized by Professor Ngeri. So they went around the country and uh, came back and told uh, President Moi then that uh, Kenyans were not keen on multipartism that they are only saying the good thing is that they want to remain in Kanu, but Kanu should reform within. But that is not what Kenyans have said. So they are trying, the President uh, Ruto now and his handlers are trying those kind of uh, gimmicks. Because we've had uh, so many reports. We have had the Waki report, we have mm -hmm. had the Krigler report, we have had uh, the Bindungu report, mm -hmm. we have had the Njonjo report, we have had BBI, we have all these uh, reports are out there. And the issues, you know, when you look at uh, the issues that, uh, the main issues, there are just four issues. We have issue number one. They were distilled very well in uh, Serena when we fought in 2007-2008. After Kofi and the late Kofi Annan came uh, here right. to mediate, they distilled the issues very well. One is the youth agenda. Issue number two, IEBC which uh, we formed the Krigler com uh, Commission. And Krigler, the late uh, Johann uh, Krigler, gave us uh, the recommendations on what we need to do about IEBC, which we've not done. Uh, because we need a functional electronic voting system. All right. Uh, we had uh, the historical injustices. We formed the Bethwell uh, Kiplagat Commission, which addressed quite a number of those issues. But a few people like uh, Matiba, the late, had uh, caught awards of about 900 million, but he has not been, the family has not been paid up to now. Then, now, then, then there is a land equation. Okay. Uh, that one applies mostly in uh, coast, in uh, Rift Valley, and in uh, the, the central part of Kenya. So, in the uh, in President Ruto's uh, manifesto, he talked about it, but he has not actualized. An inch. And I want to so come the, into... the main issue now, yes. uh, which has been there, is the issue of the youth, the youth issue. All right. uh, we did very little when President, after uh, the promulgation of, uh, of, uh, of the 2010 Constitution, President Kibaki had a Ministry for Youth, a standalone Ministry for Youth Affairs. Uh, he also formed the Youth Fund, and uh, he came up with the youth policy. But you know, largely we have ignored, we have not, uh, we have not uh, actualized the youth policy. As we are talking, for the first time, just give me a little minute. All right. For the first time in uh, our history, you know, from 1963, we've always had the youth in the cabinet. Tom Boyer was a minister at 28. Uh, Onyonga became a minister in 1969 at 29. We had uh, people like Kibaki, they were in the 27, 28 as assistant minister. Ultimately, they became minister. Even Mweshmi Kirwa here, he was a minister in his uh, 20s towards late 30s. And he did a very good job. So, uh, Msalia was minister at 29. William Root was uh, an assistant minister, I think 27 or 28. Jirong was also a minister mm -hmm. in his uh, 20s. Now, what does uh, President William Ruto do? For the first, there is no single minister who is youth. You know, when they see a babu uh, dressed like uh, a young man and shaving a box, they think he's young. But he's 49. You have uh, Alfred Mutua. He has a small body, but he's 52. Okay. So there is no single minister who is young because uh, youth is between 18 and 35. Two, he appoints an advisor for women rights affairs, Harriet Chigai, at cabinet level. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't have uh, an advisor for youth affairs. Three, when we were making the constitution, and I hope uh, Gen Z are watching this show. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, and, and listening, because it's very critical. They need to push for a reform, reform in terms of the, the MPs. The women were smart. They pushed and they got the women rep thing. 
So we created 47 seats for women uh, rep, and we also created, allowed them to benefit through the gender, the one-third gender rule, although that has been contested. But you know, we never created seats for the youth. I want, so I want to come back in, to uh, In Uganda, in Rwanda, yes. the whole of West Africa, they have youth MPs. So we need to create uh, 47 seats for the youth, specifically at the county level, so that they are able to sit and address the issues of the youth. All right. Uh, Honorable, uh, of course, uh, uh, Kirwa, you know you have been used here as an example as well, for having served at a very young age in the ministry. Uh, and uh, what happened when you were in Kibaki's ministry? There was some dissolution. Uh, at some point as well, um, looking at what is happening on the page six of one of the dailies, I think this is for uh, today. <coughs> firing an entire cabinet in a presidential system is akin to firing yourself. Please shed some light on the diplomacy around this. And <laughs> is there anything we are not learning at this point in time? Do you think the president was reactionary or did he think before he acted, and how is that going to affect any other step moving forward? Remember, Gen Z's are back on the road again tomorrow. Well, it is useful to define the two contexts. Yes. The one of 2005 and the one of 24 to 24. This time, the president himself, in his own words, said that he was firing the cabinet. He actually said he dismissed the cabinet, all of them except that of... Uh, uh, Prime Cabinet Secretary. Right. Because the other one of the Deputy President, that's a position that is guaranteed by the Constitution. Now, he said the main reason is that he did not feel the Cabinet had performed to the levels that he would have desired. This therefore means this was lack of performance. Incompetence. Yeah, incompetence. And therefore, now, when you don't perform as a team, do you blame part of the team or do you blame the entire team? This therefore means even the president himself has some kind of share on that non-performance. Did he have a team? Did he create the necessary synergy? Did he provide common vision for the entire cabinet? Was he able to allow the cabinet to operate in a way that they'd use the committees and the ministers themselves use the technical staff in various offices? Because I want to assure you, uh, Doris, that what we are lucky is that we have a strong human resource, especially in the public service. But it's only that there is lack of leadership and lack of connection between the public service and the political wing of the government. Now, fast forward, Kibaki dismissed the cabinet mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that I was part of mm -hmm. and stayed away for 11 days before formation of a new cabinet. Reason, when we went for the referendum where the government lost uh, 57 to 43, uh, it was very clear that colleagues in the cabinet were not part of the team that was with the president. And the president realized that, that was now going to create a cabinet that is not going to, f to be functional. There was going to be a bit of instability mm -hmm. and a lack of trust among the colleagues in the cabinet. So he dissolved that on the basis of the need to reorganize the country and to reorganize the nation and to have a team that will carry over for the balance of the time up to the year 2007. So in the, first, in, the, in the Kibaki case, it was clear he was trying to reorganize the team. All right. In the President William Ruto's case, he is saying there is lack of competence among his ministers. And therefore, he himself is also as a shared blame in terms of lack of performance on the part of the ministers. Okay, well, however, the president also did say that there's some positive things about his cabinet secretaries before he dismissed them. Did you not follow that part of his address? Well, I followed, but I also remembered when he said some of them are clueless, uh, much earlier, and okay. therefore it means that um, they didn't know anything. And you see if the team that is under you is not performing, either you do not choose the right team or you do not give them time to operate. And we've said it over and over that the current president is full of energy to the extent that he does not allow ministers to operate independent of his uh, patronage. How do we get beyond this? Because, uh, you know, we'll be back with uh, Eric Schaaf after uh, Eric will join us. But you're speaking on what he has not done. We're looking at a national dialogue, all right? And um, we're not sure 
how many people will be sitting there if it's 150 or more, or how Kenyans will be engaged. Remember, the president already started this conversation with Kenyans on X um, that same Friday that he welcomed Gen Z's to speak with him and to him. Um, so when you, when you anticipate that if this dialogue is successful or should be successful, how do you then advise the president uh, to approach you know, this next step? 11 days for Kibaki. The president is speaking about a tough week this week. But how, how will he approach it differently for a different cabinet, in your opinion? There are two specific steps. The first step, he should now consider forming his cabinet and uh, deal with the issue within the next 10 days and maximum 15 to 20 days. And once he forms his cabinet, then there will be dialogue from those of us who are not part of the government, including the GNCs, because what has happened is that opposition has surrendered their position to GNC. GNC is a product of lack of vibrant opposition in Kenya. Because the issues they are raising are the issues that were raised in the demonstrations that preceded the GNC demonstrations. But GNC is achieved because it was serious mass movement without a de facto leader of them. And their leadership formation, they were not able to provide weaknesses to be identified and for some people to be called up aside and to be talked to, to change their, their position. This therefore, the, the second step it's also for the president to go to the archives <clears throat> and realize what are Kenyans saying since it took over two years ago. What are the challenges? Be it employment to the military, employment to various services, is it provision of services, is it selective tender processing where those in the know or those on the right side of the equation get tenders and those who are suspected to have been not with the current regime are denied those tenders. These are small issues, but they are big because it affects each and every household. All right. Um, let me hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Enoch Komolo. Enoch, you are very clear on your standing as far as the law is concerned. We are glad to have you. And Chapter 6 is now a very key point of conversation right now. If I talk, it's on leadership uh, and integrity of all public officers. In fact, if I am not very clear, you'll correct me. The chapter is uh, predicated upon the assumption that state officers are the nerve center of the republic and carry the highest level of responsibility in the management of state affairs, and therefore, their conduct should be beyond reproach. Now. Kenyans are still on the fact that these particular leaders have to be held accountable. Even for now, they're saying President William Ruto should go. Come on. Well, uh, both, both, both state and public officers, uh, yeah, I've been listening in the background to my two other co-panelists. And um, I, I, I think that perhaps they have not understood the message. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I agree with them to some extent because I also missed the message uh, coming from Gen Z and other players in this uh, kind of new revolution space. I think the problem is not a political problem in Kenya. It's a governance problem. Mm -hmm. If you listen to the Gen Z and the message they are talking about, they don't even want to be in government. Mm -hmm. They just want accountability. And they want accountability and responsibility and some respect by those in public space. And I think that uh, this attempt to uh, approach it through some kind of national dialogue misses the point. Uh, it misses the point because it's diagonizing a problem that we've had before, but that the players are totally different. So when you look at this kind of new generation, they're not, they not interested in the traditional dialogue. And the earlier they realize this, the better. And that's why I think you can still see that Ruto must go, hashtag still trending. And it's been trending all over, even with the president sacking his cabinet, even taking additional steps with the police reform, so to speak. And I guess he will still do more over the coming weeks. But these people will not stop because they are not seeing him moving to the core. The core is, can he clean up the system? Can he promise less? But whatever he has promised, he actions first before going to the next layers. Can he and his regime stop externalizing 
challenges in Kenya. For example, bringing IMF and uh, today I think they brought the Ford Foundation and all mm -hmm. that sectoralizing that sectoralizing largely domestic problems. So immediately they internalize this, then I think we are likely to be moving to that next stage where we are now having a Kenya that is uh, two, three steps ahead of what Honorable Kikoto Kiru and the rest fought for. They fought for multi-party democracy. These people are now fighting for accountability mm -hmm. in government. And these people are fighting for chapter six. These people are, are now fighting for true independence of institutions that theoretically are independent, including reforming the police. That's why you're not seeing them fearing the military. You're not seeing them fearing the police. You are seeing them with a lot of information, including those generated through very smart artificial intelligence systems. So, well, in many ways, they're ahead of people in public service. They're ahead of the president. Yet, I think majority of those responding to this situation, including the political position, mm -hmm. are still looking at a more of a traditional political crisis, more of tribes coming together. I listened to Senator Oburu yesterday, more of tribes coming together, something called national government of national unity, which was relevant during political crisis in 2005 when Honorable Kipruto was Minister for Agriculture, mm -hmm. and we needed to have semblance of tribes presented. Now, this people are even telling you we don't need 22 uh, cabinet secretaries. They are talking of 14. In other words, we want the best amongst us. And we want once they're there, they stop flaunting their wealth. They focus on the most important thing, which is governing and taking this country to the next level. And right. if, that's my biggest fear, if mm. they continue to miss this message, the train may leave them. That's right. my biggest fear. The train may... And I'm not... Sorry the train may you. just leave every political player we are talking about today the train may just leave them if they continue to misdiagnose this particular problem and remember remember that such revolutions have happened in several other places the last one was in britain last week when they removed the uh, the, the the conservative party by serious majority the other the other a couple of months ago it happened in senegal where somebody as senegal is in africa somebody left prison two weeks later he was president that is a question of people are crying about basic governance. And mark my words, stop externalizing Kenya's local problems. All right. Wakili, I want to come back with you shortly saying, let us not externalize uh, Kenya's local problems. But before I hear from Martin, because you're equally bringing some very key uh, issues on this table, let us hear from President William Bruto. His remarks on the new Kenya. So I'm questioning if it's really well advised. Let's listen in. Si mimi nimefungua ukurasa mpya. Sasa mimi nitapanga kabisa. Hii serikali iko hapa mbele. Eh muniombe. Ndio nipange kabisa nipate wafanyikazi. Watakao nisaidia kutimiza ahadi ambazo tuliwekea na mimi na nyinyi. Kwa sababu tunataka kutransform taifa letu la Kenya. Hatuwezi kuendelea kuwa ni inchi ambaye inakopa madeni kiholela. Madeni karibu inazamisha nchi yetu. Na ndiyo nimesema, hata nimeweka jopo maalumu, ichunguze hii madeni. Hii madeni ya Kenya ni kiasi gani? Hii madeni ya Kenya ilifanya kazi gani? Na hii madeni ya Kenya tutazuia isiaribu nchi yetu kwa njia gani? So that we can have a country that is steady, that is stable, that is prosperous, and that carries the aspirations of the people of Kenya. Martin, the president has urged Kenyans to pray for him. It is a tough headache ahead. We always pray for him. The, the, the only uh, downside, you know, the president keeps on contradicting himself. He said the other day that uh, the issue of uh, public servants uh, giving out money in churches and arambias will stop. Mm -hmm. Then towards the end of that uh, discussion, he offers to come in and bring in money. You know, during President Kibaki's type, time, the public servants, because uh, Harambe has been known to be a conduit for corruption. Is it? Yes. Harambe and, uh, from the first uh, Kenyatta and Nyayo that followed the, the, the initial, were all in The, the initial uh, thinking was very good, okay. but it reached a stage when the political class hijacked it and messed it up completely. And you know, part of the anger that you've seen there is uh, opulence by people whose uh, sources are questionable. So you've seen it on uh, social media and it's all over. 
And you know, and you know that boils down to what uh, Dr. is talking about. Leadership, integrity, and accountability. And you know, there is what we call Article 1 mm -hmm. in that constitution. They need, the president must internalize the fact that uh, Article 1 is a life, and there is very little you can do about it. And you know, uh, the, the circumstances under which we are living are totally different. And uh, the political class want to behave like uh, part of the political class, because I can't say it's the entire political class. All right. Uh, the political class, part of it, especially, and you know even uh, Raila now in ODM, there are sections which uh, believe that uh, this is a political problem. But it is not. Yeah. Because <coughs> basically it's about accountability. And you know, the president also, by acknowledging, dissolving that uh, cabinet, there are two things he acknowledged. One, it is incompetent. And he's on record saying that himself. Uh, I asked one time, how do you replace uh, Professor Margaret Kobia with the Aisha Yuma in public servant service? It was meant to be a disaster, and it did. Uh, there are other guys there. We didn't expect much from them. You remember during the vetting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Penina Malonza had issues. She could not even answer questions. The committee chaired, the appointments committee of parliament chaired by Speaker Wetangula recommended that she's not fit to serve as a uh, CS. But uh, after a lot of intrigues, intrigues, Parliament approved her. Mweshmi uh, Ambadi nominated MP chairman of ODM. He's on record as saying that uh, more than 60% of those guys have no capacity of delivering. It has come to pass. You have a CS for health who tells you that she did a, a degree in pharmacy online. Honestly, in a university, she can't even pronounce. Uh, you know, this is the only cabinet. There is no single doctor there. Yet we have uh, so many doctors who can handle the issues in health. There is no single engineer there. Yet we have uh, 3,000 uh, registered engineers in the country who can handle the issue of uh, roads. You put there a lawyer who doesn't know what he's doing. He's just flashing uh, stuff. You have uh, the Minister of Lands. You put there a lawyer. They had some guy there, former MCA, who didn't know what he was doing. So, and you have uh, our Institute of Surveyors, ISK, which has uh, over 12,000 uh, land sector professional valuers, surveyors, and all that. Fair enough. So, so, so how do we get these competent people to the current cabinet? There, there, there are so many competent uh, Kenyans out there. So how you did know, we go wrong? How did we get th this? That is where people? he lost it. Okay. Because uh, he was putting uh, loyalty and psychophants ahead of everything else. You know, the people who help you get power, the other things you can uh, get them to do for you. But you know, when you want people who deliver, mm -hmm. uh, you put those ones aside. And you know, the late Mzemo used to say that uh, So you look at, uh, these are my friends. I can get something else for them to do. But I also need guys who will be able to deliver. Because if they don't deliver, we sing with them. And that's why this team, uh, that's why he had to send them away, because uh, he's reached a stage and realized, if I continue with these guys the way I'm continuing, I'm going to sink. So what we need is, and you know, we hope that in the next uh, cabinet, All right. there's going to be a balance. Mm -hmm. Out of the 22 slots, let him uh, have at least uh, 12 professionals and at least 10 politicians. Then he must also now involve the, the, the professional bodies, so that the, the, the technical ministries, you have people who understand those issues and who will be able to give you the real advice. Then uh, he also acknowledges that uh, the cabinet is not represented, does not represent the face of, uh, of Kenya. Kenya. The cabinet that Mwai Kibaki formed in 2002 was the best that uh, we've had representing uh, the face of Kenya. This one of, uh, which was dissolved, you have eight ministers from Mount Kenya with the attorney general with the deputy president. You have five CSs from the president's community. You have uh, 18 cabinet secretaries, PSS from Mount Kenya. You have uh, 18 permanent secretaries from the president's uh, community. Does that really represent the face of the, of the country? I know all those issues are in the constitution. The constitution says you must have a cabinet that represents the face of the country. All right. So all these issues uh, combined, and then with the governor, and that's why I'm telling you, 
if uh, the political class still, part of it still thinks that uh, it is business as usual, this thing called uh, the cell phone, it has changed. The, the, the information, everybody has so much information. And uh, these youth are in 2034. All right. uh, the president is using the ideas of, 20, of 1994. Raila is still stuck in 2022. So by the time we move and catch up with them, which if, we, if at all we do, it will be too late. Now, because we do not want to get to the point where it is too late. In fact, even as we're speaking, uh, there's a contentious issue around the late 24-year-old minor, uh, you know, a KCA student, which, uh, whom at this point in time, Kenyans are still not convinced, at least a section of Kenyans, including his family, are not convinced he died due to a hit-and-run accident on the road. There's some trust deficit that we are seeing in this country. And honorable, uh, and of course, uh, Kipruto Kira, as we continue, the president has talked about representatives in the forum that we expect to be a national dialogue. Uh, political parties, religious groups, the civil society, employers, and youth. Does this sound any new to you? And what would be your advice in who should be in that particular forum if it will happen? Well, uh, I just wanted to clarify a simple statement made by Dr. Eric Komolo. Uh, even from the beginning, I was very clear that we are solving, giving political solutions to problems that are about integrity. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is supposed to be... And governance. And, mm -hmm. and issues of governance. Under Chapter 6, it answers all that. And uh, my, 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 my contention, and that's why I was saying, let the president form his cabinet. Once he has formed his cabinet, we have a point of call, because at least we have a government. And the opposition should also pull back. Let us allow the issues raised by GNCs to be addressed as the president addresses other issues of national concern, because he has the capacity to get a lot of information, even from the NIS and from other sources of government. So that at the end of the day, it is not for us to tell the president what he needs to do. It's for the president to look at his uh, plate, look at the agenda that he gave to Kenyans, but deal with issues uh, through the right processes and ensure that it does not destroy the institutions that are provided for in the Constitution and provided for in other instruments of the state and other laws of Kenya. This therefore means that the president and his cabinet are going to be pivotal in terms of addressing these national issues. The rest of us can come to that national conversation, which I've always appreciated, and we hope whatever it is being told for the last two years is able to capture them, distill them, and implement them. We don't need dialogue as of now. We need to see whether the promises he has made is going to implement and is not going to renege on any of the promises he has made for the last two weeks or so. All right. If he does that, most of the problems will be solved. Um, Wakili Enoch, together with your closing remarks, perhaps because you said it is very important that the political class does not miss the point. Uh, if you're still with us, uh, Wakili, with your closing remarks, um, if, if, of course, you've said Gen Z's are very important and vital, so what should the composition of this dialogue be, if it's anything to go by, now that Raila Odinga said it's nothing to do with sitting down for any political positions. Uh, how would the Gen Z be convinced, how would the Kenyans be convinced that this time we'll speak about the cost of living, the dead Kenyans, and families that need to be compens uh, compensated, land issues, among other things? Wakili. To be honest with you, I don't think that we are anywhere close to having a national dialogue. I, I think that um, what I'm listening to that GNC want the president to hold people directly accountable. So if police officers, specific police officers are involved in violating rights of protesters, I think that what I'm hearing is that they're keen on those people being individually held accountable. Mm -hmm. I think they want to see systems that work. Uh, and systems working means that you be sensitive to their concerns, like there's somebody who I'm told to introduce renewable IDs in Kenya. I don't know where they consulted about those things. So if there are certain changes the president wants to make in this system, they should not be very radical. I think, I think that the issue of cost of living is, is pivotal, but probably not a priority for this particular group. But 
importantly, I think they want a system that works. And for the first time, I think they want political players, as we have known them, to take a back seat. So the political players will need to learn how to go around it to engage in the, in the, in the ongoing national conversation without looking like they are hijacking them. And I think national dialogue as passioned at the moment looks like it is hijacking that process. By the way, it was supposed to start today and run for yes. six days. Yes. Uh, it, is clear, it is clear that nobody attended a conversation today. It is clear that these Gen Cs have uh, decided to demonstrate tomorrow. Yes. Um, I think it's very sensitive for people to realize that until uh, this demonstration started, only Mr. Digger could call um, uh, the country to a national demonstration and things would stall. If Gen Cs are able to do it now, that's enough information. To an enough signal to tell you that you need to engage them differently. So if, if I were the president's advisor, this is what I'll do tomorrow. First, I will not allow any police officer to use live bullets. Two, I will engage in all systems possible, particularly power, to monitor any possible violations and take actions. Three, I will be very deliberate in ensuring that they go to demonstrate in designated places and where possible, start engaging them with some humility. The perception is that the president has not shown the human side of him. So he needs to start having speech that then, then, then responds to some emotional feelings that you know an average person has, particularly, you've talked about my and I was seeing the, the story online. I mean, even the things that happen in Kware, the fact is, even if they, there's a contrary view based on what the DCI was saying, the fact is, there's a trajectory of how people have been abducted. Mm. And then a part of them are, are turning out dead. So, you know, obviously people will not believe you until you create that trust. Right. And I hope that also you will learn from Trump. Following that incident um, in the US on Saturday, Trump has gone public that on Thursday his speech at the Republican National Convention is going to be about reconciliation and not attacking. All right, uh, Wakili, I want to let you go because of time. Uh, but before you talked about institutions in just 30 seconds, has the judiciary failed yes. Kenyans? Is the judiciary failing Kenyans as an institution and as an arm of government that should be independent as an advocate who also presents Kenyans in this particular corridor? The, the, the general fact is that most institutions, including the judiciary, have not been allowed to perform at their peak. One of the, one of the many ways to frustrate them is to not give them financial independence. So yes, judiciary has not performed at the peak, but largely because post-2010 constitution, we have not been, we have not internalized, and I think it is Mr. Um, the, the, the other gentleman, Mr. Anditi, who Adati. indicated Adati. that... yes. Yes, and that yes, and that yes who indicated that, you know, we have this wonderful institution that we bestowed up upon ourselves, but those implementing the constitution may not have internalized the values. Right. So yes, several institutions, including parliament, judiciary is slightly better, by the way, compared to parliament and the Senate and the police, then you realize we are more or less, we have independent offices and institutions on paper. But now, and Mark Mawas, GNC are saying these institutions have to work. Thank if you. we give you a job as a commissioner, you have to deliver and we'll hold you individually responsible. Thank you very much, uh, Enoch Komolo, who is an advocate, of course, for joining us and uh, giving us your perspectives on this matter. Martin and Dati, now that you've been mentioned uh, right on time, what are your closing remarks? Uh, unfortunately, for just 30 seconds, uh, in the way forward for first Gen Zs who are going back on the streets tomorrow and for the government. The president has to learn to listen more. And he should not listen to himself. You know, I was uh, telling my brother, Kirwa, you have a child who comes home and tells you he or she wants boots. Then you don't ask which boots, so you go and buy gumboots. In the morning when you present the gumboots, the child wonders what is wrong with you. Because uh, the child wanted football boots to go and play football. You have bought gumboots. So the president is not listening to what uh, the Gen Z are talking about. Because the issues are very clear. I had seen, uh, you had put them on right. the screen there. Yes. And uh, that is what, those are the, the, what they will call irreducible minimums. He needs, if he were to address those issues, 
and stop uh, rooftop governance because he was in Nakuru today. On uh, Saturday he was in uh, Kaptagat planting trees. On Sunday he was in Nyahururu in church. Of course, uh, in Nyahururu he went with one vehicle. That is a, a good sign for austerity. That is very positive. Uh, but today, being a Monday, we would have expected him to be in the office, seated down, because he doesn't have a, a cabinet to help him uh, mm. run the country now. There are heavy issues. You know, the solution of a cabinet is not uh, a small issue. So we would have expected him to sit down. Uh, he should be working on the issue of the permanent secretaries. He should be working on the possible uh, names that uh, would be in cabinet. And you vet them. Uh, go through. Don't allow even just the NSIS alone to give you uh, information that uh, is raw, you know. As he has is. a mechanism of uh, getting all this information. If I bring you a name and I tell you this guy is good, uh, you check. Because if you don't check, the Gen Z's are actually, they have what they call online DCI. Uh, the moment, like now, what the names which have been circulated uh, online, they have already, they already have info on all those guys, you know. Right. So you present a name, when you present it to parliament, they put uh, all the negative things about that guy. You look very, you look like you don't know what you are doing. So Thank to you. stop all that embarrassment mm -hmm. and make sure that uh, there is continuity the way Mwishmi Okiro has said, and to make sure that the institutions are functioning, uh, let him now do more than he's doing. Stop, sit in the office, work more. All right. And he doesn't need to be talking uh, every other day. You know, we know Kenyans don't want to see you every other day you are in the, you are all over the place. You know? All right, Martin, yeah. because of time. Uh, but thank you very much. You're saying the president should listen a little more and yes. act a little more. Uh, Kirwa, uh, let's just hear very short remarks, 30 seconds. Yeah, one, the president should form his cabinet he should not call it government, uh, gov government of national unity. All right. Let him form his cabinet. He won the elections. He was pronounced by Jabukati. The opposition should refrain from being part of that cabinet so that there is clear separation of powers between the opposition and the government of the day. Otherwise, the opposition and the government of the day might be swept out of the streets by the GNC should they misbehave. Should they misbehave? And of course, you've equally spoken on bad manners, political bad manners. Um, we still keep our eyes and ears on, the, you know, on what is happening in the country. Limited time, of course. I wish we'd go on and on. But we appreciate first the viewership of the Kenyans who have been streaming live on our social media platforms. Uh, Eno Komolo, the advocate who spoke to us virtually this evening. Uh, Waziri? Yes. Kipruta Rapkirwa? for creating time to be here. Equally now, a governance expert, a veteran for that matter, Martin Andati, a governance and political analyst for creating time to be here as well. Now, Kenyans, I want to share with you what to expect on the front page of The Standard tomorrow, as our job is to inform you and civic education, and as well as tell you what exactly is happening in the country as it happens. Tomorrow, on the front page of The Standard, running out of excuses that is what you expect as the front page tomorrow and who to blame it started with blaming the opposition it went to former president Uru Kenyatta. now it is non-governmental organizations that are being accused of funding the gen z protests however government seems to be groping in the dark on how to address the governance issues it faces more of that on page four, just a glimpse of it. So do grab a copy tomorrow, both on your online gadgets and physically, that is a hard copy. All right, do of course keep engaging with us at KTN News across all the social media platforms and here is where you get the whole story. On behalf of the entire team that made this a success, my name is Anki Doris Sombat. Enjoy the rest of your viewing, have a good night.